Hello, and thank you for joining us. Um, so, I'm part of a small startup uh, located here in Denmark, in Aarhus, called Unsilo. We uh, work with big scientific publishers to process article information and to make tools for researchers. And um, so maybe I um, should start with um, explaining the mission that we set up four years ago when we started the company. Um, so our idea was to build a system um, of discovery services that could make it easy to find patterns across a lot of unstructured text. Um, today, or um, a couple of years ago, the way things were linked uh, when you looked at an article and tried to find something similar was using uh, human annotated editors' keywords. Uh, that's how you find uh, related articles uh, in science. Um, and the big challenges that we saw uh, with the system as it was, uh, was that um, because scientific language uh, is constantly evolving and growing and new things are being discovered, um, it's impossible to keep up with uh, sort of hand uh, curation of, of content. Um, it also, a system also has to be omniscient because presently it's, a, it's an author and an editor that looks at a paper and tries to decide what's the important aspects of this article. And sometimes really interesting discoveries are really only apparent in hindsight. Um, so you need an automated system that can correlate a new article to tons of other things that are currently going on. Figure out if stuff, people in China are doing something exactly similar to what you're trying to do. Uh, then finally, it has to be unbiased. Because uh, right now we have this problem, most of the sort of um, uh, recommenders and the content curation that's automated today is based on sort of collaborative filtering or like the stuff you see on Amazon, people who bought this also bought that. It tends to lead us down the same path and it tends to make researchers trying to do something new walk straight by the most interesting stuff because that's what everyone else also does. Um, so we need an unbiased approach that doesn't rely on some kind of popularity ranking. Uh, like page rank or collaborative filtering. Sounds a little odd. Uh, is it okay? Um, I don't have that fancy clicker. Um, so the core technology that we've built uh, is based on a lot of uh, open source components or at least uh, free components. Um, we, we have a document processing pipeline uh, built around Apache UEMA and, and Ruta. Uh, and we run sort of standard natural language processing uh, pipeline and tools on top of that. Um, and then we use common languages like Python for prototyping, Java, and a lot of libraries and, and, and stuff in the, I guess, the data scientist's toolbox. Um, the key challenges of what we're trying to do is that unstructured knowledge, text, um, basically does not compute. Um, as I said before, there's too much stuff going on for humans to be involved in this process. And even when humans are involved on a higher level in building ontologies to represent the knowledge that we have of a certain discipline, it's not going fast enough. All the interesting stuff uh, that was found out yesterday or last month or even six months ago has not made it into a... Uh, a curated ontology yet. So if you really want to be at the forefront where the money is and, and, and where things matter in research, you really need a more dynamic approach. Um, so even when there are dictionaries or reference works, it's, it's not, simply not comprehensible enough. And then the second big problem that we have is that people are way too creative. They don't use like just one name for a certain phenomenon. They have many different variations and they often add descriptive detail uh, in their own language that makes absolutely no sense to a computer and makes it really difficult to figure out what they're actually talking about. There is no right way to describe anything in the world, and, uh, and we somehow have to figure out what people are talking about. Um, so, as I said, finally, there's all this, all the data that people consider um, um, obvious, 
that's probably the biggest problem for, for uh, analytics today or for computer AI in general. All the stuff that people consider obvious and then fail to include in a description of anything. Um, so those are the sort of the key problems that we're, that we're trying to solve. Um, here's a piece of text. It's an article from 2006. Uh, and if you use a regular sort of um, full text search or um, some kind of uh, um, standard search engine and you throw this, it's an abstract of an article, the real article is probably 10 times as long, um, then it's really difficult to see what this text is really about. And if I read this, how do I figure out what other articles talk about the same things? Um, so uh, today, um, we use computers to annotate the words that we know what means. So these are the words that are found in common sort of uh, dictionaries and ontologies of this, um, of this area. Um, and um, we have, uh, at our company, developed a, a much more comprehensive way of looking at this and dynamically, statistically deriving longer phrases that mean stuff and we figure out which mean approximately, which of them mean approximately the same thing. And uh, right now, as I said in the, uh, I think in the remarks for the talk, I'm also going to try to talk a little bit about where we want to take things and what we're currently working on. Um, and it's not just, as you can see, we're trying to cover all of the information that is actually in an article, try to map that out and make it searchable, make it findable. Um, and we're presently working on uh, all of the actions and relationships between these things so that when you find stuff that talks about A and B, the most relevant article is probably the one that talks about A and B in approximately the same context or the same sentence or even talks about how A is related to B. Um, today you can also do this with sort of distance, number of words in between uh, when you use a traditional search engine. But the thing is, when you're working with text, then sometimes the number of words in between cross a paragraph boundary or sometimes it's the image text that's right next to that really interesting other thing that you were looking for. So, and, and other times, actually the thing that you're interested in is mentioned up here with that third thing, and down here the other thing is mentioned with that third thing. So they're actually really closely connected, but they're just at odd ends of the article. Um, so you need a better understanding of this, and we actually use uh, graph analytics to understand the proximity of things and the centrality of things in, in an article. Uh, so the first step we, we perform is uh, regular natural language processing. Um, some of you may be familiar with this, but uh, the simplest uh, part of a natural language processing, the thing that you can do without too much computation, is the part of speech tagging. Basically, assigning uh, word classes to each uh, word. Is this a verb or is it a noun in this context? Is it an a uh, adjective? Um, and, and once we have the part of speech tagging, we, ac we actually uh, can find a lot of candidates for potential things in the sentence. So as you can see here, um, we have a sentence from the abstract you just saw, uh, methods for measuring sodium concentration in serum by indirect sodium selectro selective electrode potentiometry. So I've highlighted underneath, for those who don't read uh, articles on a daily basis, there are four things here in an action, uh, if you will, uh, in common speak. Um, and if we extract all of the things here, um, they seem pretty straightforward. Uh, so, so what's the beef? Um, so it turns out you can say these things in many different ways, and if you want to see other content uh, that is closely related to this article, you need to not, not just look at the ones that include those exact words, you need to also look at the ones that uh, mention these same things in different ways. So we have to deduplicate, basically. Um, so we work with um, Springer Nature, which is one of the larger um, uh, scientific publishers in the world. Um, they've given us um, all of their content and we've sifted through it. We found um, at, uh, on the other side of a hundred million things in their content. Um, and we then, after uh, processing that in various ways, deduplicate that down to maybe two or three million different things. And even when you're down at two or three, two or three million different things, you still have um, separation between things that maybe a human reader would find to be mostly the same thing. Uh, so there's a lot of deduplication you need to do if you can look at the examples here. So concentration of sodium can be 
um, uh, mapped back to sodium concentration. You can also have like, uh, sentences like the electrode potentiometry was indirect. Well, obviously, that's the same as indirect electrode potentiometry. Um, you can talk, some people like to call things a methodology rather than a method. And sometimes people talk about sera and plural rather than serum. So these are what we call morphological or you know, syntactical variations, basically the things that depend on the grammar. Uh, we also try to reduce the uh, lexical and semantic variations. That's when authors use uh, synonyms or hyponyms, which are like more generic, general terms for the same thing. Um, so um, for, for parts of our pipeline, we actually also do so, that sort of abstraction. Um, so whenever someone says method, we might map that back to a more generic uh, term called mechanism. Uh, serum sample is actually a type of blood sample, like the serum is the blood with the something filtered out. Uh, that's not my primary <laughs> um, business. Um, and serum, sodium concentration, well, sodium actually is the, I guess, the American term for natrium, or I guess Brits also use that um, sometimes. And um, indirect electrode potentiometry that we've now seen a couple of times is actually a type of electroanalysis. Um, so when we look at longer sentences or longer phrases, we actually go in and replace each of the tokens uh, with a more generic term to figure out if this is actually a variation of something that we've seen before. And all of this has really nothing to do with machine learning. This is just hard-coded um, understanding of linguistic uh, variations. Uh, so we have um, um, compound paraphrases and adjectival uh, modifiers and coordinations where you mention things like uh, the concentration of sodium and uh, magnesium can be expanded into concentration of magnesium and concentration of sodium, and all of these tedious rules that you actually need to perform before you can do any type of sort of aggregated understanding. Um, and then, final two couple of things. Um, there are uh, often uh, we're looking at um, fragments of something else or we're looking at something that contains a fragment which is more interesting. So um, uh, sometimes it's the indirect potentiometry and no one else in the world has ever put sodium selective in between there. Um, so we have to identify that and, and take sort of author-specific variations out of the question because they mean absolutely nothing to anyone else in the world. Um, and here we come to also this matter of adding additional descriptive detail that can really, really be in the way of understanding what's going on. Uh, so clinically implemented indirect something or error-prone indirect ion selective, whatever, whatever. Um, these are all things that get in the way of understanding what's really being spoken about. Um, then once we have deduplicated um, all this, uh, these tons of things, really, uh, we look at uh, different types of features. Um, so the local features in the document uh, include how many times it's mentioned, uh, what's it connected to. We actually calculate um, uh, a position in a document graph. We connect all the things in the, the mentioned in the document with the relationships that connect them, and then do regular sort of graph analysis to figure out what's central and what's sort of a peripheral uh, to, to what's being talked about. So you can have something that's only mentioned once, but really central because it's connected to that very one central thing. And you can have stuff out here that's maybe mentioned a couple of times, but always in relation to stuff that's non-central. Um, and, um, and then, of course, uh, we run these um, um, other types of analytics that use the textual context, so the words right before and right after a piece of text. Um, the global features that we use are also sort of occurrence count, the number of documents that uh, contain the given phrase, and we run various sort of um, uh, fancy algorithms to figure out what the most common variation, uh, if you have a, a set of an n-gram, if you will, a phrase of words, uh, what's the most common used uh, variation if you add an additional adjective in front, uh, what's the most commonly used adjective. Um, or what are the two most common things, and are they sufficiently diff diff uh, different to be two different things? Um, then, of course, we also calculate, I guess many of you are probably also familiar with the TFIDF, which is basically deviation in, in frequency from, from a norm. 
So if things occur more uh, often than they do on average, um, that's, uh, that's a significant uh, um, uh, phrase probably. Um, and then we look at distribution across the corpus. Uh, so things, a thing can be mentioned uh, very few times, but whenever someone uses that thing, they mention it over and over again in the same document. So that means it's probably it's got some significance. But if you look at it globally and just count the number of documents it occurs in, it may seem insignificant. Uh, so we have this uh, concentration score, which basically tells us um, when, it, when it occurs in a document, uh, how, how likely is it occur, to occur more than once. Um, and then we also do an uh, analysis comparing um, uh, the uh, distribution to domain uh, regions to figure out if this is something that's very common but only in a certain domain. Um, and all of these um, things are factored into the, uh, our learning algorithms or ranking models. Um, we also use uh, the aggregated textual context. And this is uh, uh, the, uh, I'm going to get back to that in a little while. This is the word to vec or um, word embeddings uh, models uh, that uh, the previous speaker also mentioned. Uh, so if we look at all the occurrences of a given phrase across the entire corpus, uh, that tells us something about um, what it means or what other things might mean the same thing. Um, and then, of course, the biggest thing when you're trying to train a model is um, the, um, um, the thing that you're training it on. Uh, so we have two types of things that we can train on. Um, we have uh, human training data, uh, this could be the articles themselves. We figure out if we have an hypothesis, hypothesis that a given concept is uh, very central to an article, we can compare it and see if we actually found it in the abstract. So if it's in the abstract or in the title, there's a high likelihood that the author also considers it important. So that's one data point. Uh, and then aggregated over thousands or millions of, of uh, articles that actually can tell us how good we are at selecting the things that authors find important. Uh, of course, if we think we can do better than the authors, that's a lousy way uh, to measure it. Um, so we also use uh, other types of human training data, uh, behavioral data from the uh, companies we work with. Um, they kindly allow us access to um, usage patterns when we present something to users, which of these things that we extract uh, did they actually click on, find interesting. Um, and, um, and which articles, when presented with a list of articles, related articles on this, in a sidebar, for instance, um, which of these were found to be most uh, interesting or clicked upon by, by users. Turns out, of course, it's the ones with the promising titles that get clicked on, not necessarily the ones that are most similar. So sometimes you need to make adjustments just to, uh, to create some uh, link bait. So the other type of uh, synthetic data that we use is um, uh, data that we use is synthetic data. So we can actually construct an artificial corpus um, and, and train our models on that and try to improve our models uh, uh, using the principles that we, that we use to create the, the synthetic data. Uh, it's slightly more complex, but you can actually, um, that's, that's how the demo, if any of you have tried uh, word to vec the demo that they create there is actually completely uh, synthetic. Um, and um, you can also um, build partially synthetic data sets, um, one that uh, we've tried and that actually was also used on, on word to vec was to use a different search engine to create uh, your artificial corpus. So you search for something, uh, maybe two different concepts, two different words, uh, and then you mix them together and you remove all traces of the words that you searched for. So the only thing that's left or everything else in the document. Uh, and then you try to figure out if you can still classify what was what and, the, um, and, and dump things in the right pile. Um, so a little bit about word embeddings. Um, so the previous author mentioned it. Here's uh, an example. Um, basically, what you do is you build a, a vector, or it's actually a tensor. It's a combination of vectors. Um, uh, so each, each word or token or phrase, uh, we work on phrases in our corpus, uh, is actually defined in this vector space by uh, an aggregation of uh, vectors uh, uh, that it commonly co-occurs with. Um, so the traditional uh, word to vec uh, uh, algorithm will just work on, uh, uh, create, treat all text as a, as a token 
um, every token as its own vector. Um, and then only a few things get concatenated because they belong together. Uh, so we, we pre-process the text quite a lot and figure out after we've deduplicated all these 100 million things, we're down to so few million things that they actually have decent occur occurrence counts. Because the big problem when you're looking at larger selections of text is that they're kind of statistically more unlikely than the word, each word on its own. Uh, so you have a problem with, um, for instance, uh, hyperemic flow doesn't necessarily occur that many times, even when you have a million documents or 10 million documents. Um, it's still something so specific that you only have a few hundred occurrences. So it's important to capture all of them, even when the author calls it something different. But after we've done all that deduplication, we actually end up with a corpus where we can run a vector model or generate a vector model. Um, and then we use other things on top. Uh, so we know that uh, uh, coronary vasodilation actually is defined in an ontology. It's related to all these different things. And then we combine things uh, using our sort of the structured knowledge of that domain uh, to further refine uh, the vector model. And, and that's worked really well for us. Um, here's, uh, this is just a little data dump from uh, a test a while ago. But um, what you see here are um, uh, phrases and uh, occurrence counts in, in a test corpus of, I think, uh, a million articles. And here you can see, um, like the first line, deionized water is actually part of a set. It extends further to the right. Um, but the first line you can see, uh, deionized water is actually the same or has a similar vector uh, as biodistilled water, ultra pure water, di water, d slash ionized water, or double distilled water. Um, and these are important, important to notice that this is the output from a. a um, a vector model where we basically, for each concept in the first column, we uh, find the nearest concepts, uh, the, most, uh, the concepts that appear in the most similar context. So the, the algorithm actually does not even look at the letters. It just has uh, an ID, and then it knows the ID of the, the things around it. Um, and so uh, it's pretty obvious here that, um, that it's actually possible just from the hypothesis is that words that mean approximately the same are used in approximately similar contexts. So the 10 words or five words before and after over a million documents will be very similar for things that, although they are different uh, phrases, mean more or less the same thing. So you can see when things are used interchangeably, um, that is very much the case. So for instance, uh, row, I guess, uh, six or so, crucial role actually is uh, more or less the, uh, interchangeably used with prominent role, vital role, fundamental role, pivotal role, or essential role. Sounds about right. Uh, and again, it's, uh, it's a great validation. Sometimes people work with data sets and they rarely ever see like, anything else than floating point values. Here you can actually look at it and see that it does actually make sense. Uh, and if you're in doubt, you, uh, when, when, when we do a sort of limited QA to see if things have become garbled by some bug introduced somewhere. Um, you can always just um, like look it up on Wikipedia or something, see, does this make sense? Uh, and I think, um, so pivotal role, key player, essential role, yeah. Um, so it actually works. It's possible to run this even on phrases, uh, which uh, I think we have been the first to do. So the upshot of this, what have we done? We've created human-readable fingerprints. So we've, for any given text, regardless of the, the, the type of language used, we can extract some, um, some phrases that we know what they mean, and we can map them to uh, uh, the most commonly used uh, definition or phrase that means the same thing. And for a person skilled in the arts, as they say, it's kind of easy to suddenly see what an article is about. We can rank them and we can tell you the five, ten things that are most important in an article. And when people say, if you look at the graph up there, when, when, when some author mentions insulin insensitivity in obese children, we will know that that article that was written a couple of years ago about overweight girls and reduced hormone response is actually talking about the exact same thing. And that's a, that's a, that's a very big leap in the way we recommend uh, texts in, in science or indeed anywhere. So traditional document similarity uh, relies on, as I said, to recap, the, the words that we know what means. 
Um, sometimes word can be, words can be ambiguous, and that's a big problem. Um, so there's what we call the phrase hypothesis, which is what we're working on. When you have a longer selection of words that stack together in the same fashion, they rarely have a different meaning. They often have a very precise meaning. Um, and that's uh, the, the ability to capture those phrases dynamically um, is basically what, what we do. Um, so once you have these fingerprints, you can actually produce all kinds of uh, different features uh, that make it easier uh, for researchers, make life easier. Uh, so what we've delivered to, to the partners that we work with are an ability to first, as I said, highlight the things uh, that are most um, uh, the principal components of an article. So this is an article page. Some of you may have seen one. If you search on Google for an article title, you get bounced to a publisher's web page where that article is presented. Um, and so we help make that page better. We help uh, make it easier for readers to understand what's going on. And we can pull out key sentences, and we can recommend stuff. We can tell the user, oh, this is where they mention that thing you're interested in. They use some different words, but it's about the same thing. And we can provide related content, um, basically articles that are talking about the same things. Uh, and when we do that, we not only just provide a related article, we'd actually tell you what it is, how this overlaps with what you're currently looking at. So uh, we can actually show you, oh, these are the concepts that occur here that also occurs in the article you're presently looking at. And we can actually also, we've done an interactive version that allows the user to drill down and further explore. Uh, it has to contain this and this and then get a recommendation here. Um, so we work very closely with uh, Springer, Nature, and um, Scientific American, um, Macmillan, many of the largest uh, publishers. And we produce things like this. Um, so I guess the, it's a little difficult to see the highlights here. Um, but um, in essence, this is the non-schematic version of what I just saw, uh, told you. Um, on the right side, we have related content. You can click any of the things you're interested in and get a filtered list of the most similar articles that also contain this thing you're interested in. Um, we also do um, also other types of visualizations with related content. Um, we can use our technology to find definitions of things. So many of these scientific publishers have uh, a large back catalog of reference works or uh, teaching books, if you will, that define different concepts. So um, uh, users can, uh, can click on uh, something like RNA editing and we can pick up the best definition we can find in, um, in the um, publisher's literature uh, and not just uh, rely on the stuff that's on Wikipedia. Um, and more interesting, uh, we're also working on building um, um, tools that allow researchers to, to see uh, the, the more of the history uh, that uh, the stuff they're interested in uh, uh, is sort of a, a part of. So here uh, is a, a tool that we call Timeline that uh, for a given article here uh, in some time in the past, I guess around 2003, the selected article there, um, we use the reference, uh, the um, um, citation data, uh, forwards and backwards citations to figure out which things were cited by this paper and which papers cite this paper. So forwards and backwards in time. Uh, but that's a very, very large set uh, because when you have a single uh, article, they often cite 10, 20, 50 other papers, each of which cite another 10, 50, 100 papers. So it's a very huge tree. And then what we do is that we basically prune that tree to just look at the branches that have um, articles that talk about the same thing. And that allows you to fairly easily identify an article from last year which talks about the same thing and actually through a couple of links cites the article that you're presently looking at. Or if you're looking at a recent article, you can say who was the first author uh, in this citation tree to actually combine this and that in, in a paper. Um, so um, the, the value that we're providing to researchers, and this is, uh, uh, we're kind of proud of that, is that we accelerate the, um, um, the path to a successful uh, uh, discovery by pointing directly to what is relevant in an article. And we can also provide more relevant um, um, suggestions because they're 
uh, much more precise than, than competing technologies. And then we provide, so our little company actually also provides end user uh, features, because we believe that it's that understanding of the algorithms used and how they um, actually, um, how different algorithms will favor different things, and, um, and that actually is important for the feature you're trying to construct. What, how, you, how you're going to rank these, and it's actually very dependent on the type of use cases that you're trying to solve. And for our, our clients, the publishers, they're really happy that they can roll out a feature across many different types of context, content. Uh, even so, in biomedical, for instance, uh, gene research or uh, drugs, uh, diseases, there's a lot of structured um, documentation, a lot of ontologies, all gene names, at least discovered until fairly recently, are logged in uh, an open access uh, ontology. And, uh, and documentation is really, really good in that small field of science. But everywhere outside of that, it's much, much worse. Um, if you look at um, humanities in general, there are rarely any, um, any official ontologies available that tell you which words are important or which things is a synonym of what. And, uh, and so what we do uh, actually is very important to, to, to developing this type of services or recommendations um, for, for all the other disciplines. Um, so future directions, well, as I said, we're currently working on um, understanding the relationships between all these features or things that we extract. There are so many different ways that you can say a given thing, and when you talk about the relationship between two things, there's an equal amount of different ways you can say things. Um, so just the fact that serum uh, consists mostly of water can be said in so many different ways. And, uh, <laughs> And the thin, uh, thin film coated gold nanoparticles we're currently working on a nano uh, product for the, the nano industry uh, with a partner. Uh, that can also be said in a number of different ways. But what's interesting is, of course, that these relationships, when they stack up, we can replace the two things, the subject and the object, and then have a general understanding of how this relationship can be described. And so we're trying to, that's a big challenge for us, is trying to normalize and, and reduce the types of relationships uh, uh, between things and, and, and the corpus. Um, another big uh, forward-looking feature is to provide our services um, uh, to other companies that are trying to solve problems and have access to unstructured text, but no ability to process it. Um, so we're working with a couple of large um, companies to. Uh, to make, basically make large text collections computable. Um, so, so much of what we do can be applied on an in, any given sort of large collection of text, um, and, and you can do all sorts of really interesting uh, analytics on it once you know what's what and what's similar and what's the important aspects of, of text. Um, and then ultimately, where we want to go is, um, is to do reasoning at scale. Um, that's really what you need in order to, to augment scientific research most efficiently. You need to be able to reason what is this, how, what's the causal chain of events here, and is, is this a disputed fact? Does everyone say that this is how things are, or are there things that, that uh, maybe long chains of, of causality that go unnoticed um, that can only really be uncovered by, by massive analytics? Um, so I guess the, the ultimate prize there is the, the cure for cancer. <laughs> um, so, so I guess we, we have a small team. We're actually located in, in, in Aarhus, in the uh, second town of Denmark. Um, we're uh, 18 people, I think, now. Um, and, um, and all of them have worked at large, big, big uh, international companies and basically chosen to come to work with us for measly salaries and living in the suburbs. Um, because we're so excited about the, the promise of, of, of uh, assisting uh, science. We have no Danish clients. We all work with uh, international publishers. So, um, yes, we are hiring. And uh, <laughs> so feel free uh, to apply. Um, we're, we're growing right now and uh, would love to receive um, applications from you guys. So I think that... Uh, concludes my speech, and I'd love to answer questions. There's a ton of detail that I left out that uh, if you have any sort of 
There are really specifics. many questions. You, you've been Excellent. good at uh, asking questions with that. So uh, the first one is, is clickstream analysis used to analyze behavioral data such as hyperlinks between articles? And do you use Spark for this? Um, yes, I think we do use Spark. So I'm, confession, even though I grew up with a computer uh, and I coded uh, demos on my C64 in, in my parents' bedroom uh, in the 80s, uh, I actually do not work as a developer in our company. I'm uh, one of the founders and I sell the vision. Uh, so I can actually uh, uh, answer accurately. Uh, we do look at clickstream data, um, but mostly uh, it's, not, it's uh, limited to profile building, not sort of session analysis, uh, because um, uh, we, we do, there's a lot of noise and people get distracted. So if you have subsequent clicks through a corpus, it really just a it attributes that tells you something about what the user is interested in, not necessarily that the things that they click on are related because uh, people get distracted. So, so yes, we use clicks, but not really streams. And if you use, uh, uh, if you do clickbait, isn't that man manipulation, <laughs> or at least we, we were actually asked to do this? So uh, yeah, <laughs> um, so I think it's uh, there. Are, you're always when you're working with big corporations, you have different layers of management, and they have dis different sort of um, key performance indicators. Uh, and uh, and the people that work uh, in the front end would like to see a feature used. Uh, so you need to optimize the data for a feature to be used. Um, I think it's, n I guess the reason I can still fall asleep at night <laughs> is that um, I, th I think what we're doing is vastly superior to the traditional sort of uh, co-download statistics that are used um, in science. Um, normally the things that get recommended across scientific publishers are the things that other people downloaded the same session. Uh, and I think um, one of the biggest problems with that, just to do a little diversion here, is that um, when you only look at behavioral data, that you have absolutely no way of recommending that new article that came out yesterday, because you have no behavioral data attached to it. And it's a, a, what we call the cold start problem. And unless you can identify that this article is very similar to this other article that has behavioral data, you can actually not make a, re a decent recommendation until by accident people stumble across it and you know who actually did something with it. So, so I think what we do here, obviously this is a Jekyll and Hyde thing and the, the best solution is always a combination of the two factors. How do you make uh, rules for classifying words or phrases that are very domain specific across the many different research domains? So, um, there's um, actually um, very few phrases that are exactly similar across, or have very different meanings, but are syntactically similar across uh, domains. And most of that problem we've actually sort of circumnavigated uh, by looking at longer phrases um, and by filtering out the stuff um, that, ha that has ambivalence. Uh, so you will actually see that we uh, try to not mention things that, when mentioned alone, can, can mean different things. Then we add uh, uh, an additional uh, token in front of it, oftentimes it becomes uh, much less ambiguous, and we then prefer that one. Um, and that's simply a sh an algorithmic solution, it's not something that we hard code. Uh, but we actually look at the, the, the ones that have ambiguity and try to pick longer phrases that, or supersets that include it. Do you do any kind of personalization? Um, we're, we don't have a product uh, for personalization because it's not, it's a big uh, hot potato in science. Um, people are really afraid of being tracked because they think they have the cure for cancer and they don't want, like, search history is a complete no-go uh, and for most of the clients that we work with. Um, so we, haven't, we, we don't have a product yet. We think it's incredibly interesting and we'd love to do it, but we don't have a partner to do it with, and probably it's going to be outside of science. Um, what is the scale of data used in your processing? How much data words to train your model? Um, so, so that's another thing. The first two years of our, um, uh, of our startup, we were trying to build a Google Scholar competitor. We wanted to build a destination site where users could come, search in full-text articles, 
not see the full text articles, but we would like index them for publishers and then link out to the real content. And we spoke to many different um, scientific publishers and they all said that's a brilliant idea and they had so many meetings with us for two years and they said, oh, here's another test sample that you can have of our content. And they said, and once we're ready to go, you'll have this hard drive with a ton of articles and it'll be no problem and everybody will be happy. And then after two years and only a few thousand articles from each publisher and a ton of meetings where they asked about our technology in depth and detail, we went out and one night I'm in London, I remember, and one of the product managers, or I, he was actually a, a v, VP level in, in, in one of those um, scientific publishers, over a beer said, you know, it's never going to happen. <laughs> They're just keeping you close because they want to know what kind of technology you're developing. And I think uh, a few months after that, we pivoted into a different uh, business plan where we provide our value in lieu of too little uh, open access material. We decided to work within the framework of the publishers and be their friends. Um, and so now what we're providing are service it, uh, services that are primarily focused on uh, on using one publisher's data to perform uh, services for that one publisher's clients. And so clients, the larger uh, publishers have um, like 10 to 15 million articles. Uh, some of the aggregators have more, uh, but uh, most, uh, most of our clients have less than 10 million uh, documents. So with each document being, I don't know, um, a few hundred K in, in, in simple ASCII. That's, it's not crazy amounts of data, it's a few terabytes for a larger publisher. So, uh, as Jonathan Swartz found out, it could easily be dumped <laughs> anywhere on the internet, but uh, I, everyone would be sued. Okay. <laughs> would it uh, make sense to pretty print an article, normalize it, and republish it along with the original? And uh, uh, do you have a a tool for that? Um, so no, we don't. Um, we cannot provide access to the, the the full text. We work with publishers, and they are. It's a very tightly controlled um, uh, uh, business. Um, they their primary business asset, at least until open access becomes more dominant, um, is the content that they own and control. Uh, so so we we really can't do much with it. Uh, except behind closed doors. We had, when we worked with Elsevier last year, like the forms we had to fill out for compliance, of security, were crazy. I, mean, I think 147 pages, uh, tabs in an Excel sheet with 100 questions in each. <laughs> so that was just the, the, uh, yeah, the survey questions before they sent the person over. So yeah, they're, they're really, really crazy about security. Uh, are you using uh, Lambda architecture? And can you talk about that? Um, um, I'm not familiar with Lambda architecture. I know like Lambda uh, as the um, um, Lambda coefficients, but no, no, probably, maybe we are. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what is the most interesting finding you have done in in your data? <laughs> for cancer, cancer. We haven't found that yet. I guess we would have published it. So we're a service provider. So we work with um, what the industry calls subject matter experts or um, SMEs. And so um, we have models where we validate the quality of what we do and, uh, um, and, and, and the error rates, etc. They're all automated uh, tests. And then, of course, we run it by some selection, a panel of real scientists that can look at it and then know the, the content that we've processed and can tell if there's an error somewhere, a word that we left out that was important. Um, but we can't really evaluate ourselves. So we, we know that the scientific uh, publishers we work with, the editors there, uh, say that we have the best extraction algorithms that produce the best and most usable phrases and results. So that, that's what we go at. We actually don't know what it's being used for. <laughs> okay, uh, what about articles published in the public domain, uh, published on open platforms? Are you indexing and presenting articles from these alternative uh, sources? Yes, we are working with a couple of open access uh, publishers, um, and uh, sorry about that. Um, 
Uh, and, um, and so, so the, the, the open access uh, model has sort of turned publishing inside out, uh, where traditionally um, traditional publishers actually um, publish your thing for free as long as you sign over copyright. Uh, for open access, you have to pay for the peer-to-peer um, -peer review process and the publishing, of course, that cost has come down a lot from a few years ago. But you still pay around 2,000 euros to publish an article. Uh, and that sort of puts a little damper on uh, the growth of, of open access. Um, but, um, but we do work with uh, some of the open access providers, and we had this idea when we started uh, our company that we would just aggregate all of open source. And that's fine. Um, good luck if you want to try, because the only people that have succeeded in doing anything vaguely resembling that are just aggregating the metadata. Because it turns out that people publish their... Um, um, uh, there are articles in a, in a gazillion different formats on a gazillion different websites where sometimes the download button is behind some kind of uh, I'm not a robot capture, and uh, it's really, really hard to get at the content. It's the biggest mistake that the open access community has done. It's not agreeing on some submission standard that allows their data to or their text to be mined, and I just don't see why no one has come up and said, this is how you do it, this is the format. Give us a Jets XML file right here on an FTP server, dump it there, and, and let the community do the rest. But it hasn't been done, so it's not, the, it's not a task for startups. It's incredibly time consuming to deal with thousands of different submission formats. And PDFs, I mean, you may think PDF is a nice format, but it just turns out that sometimes the renderer will swap the, um, the, um, the order of sentences around, and it's impossible to figure out which sentence is completed over here, or um, you don't want to know. So, so we, we have to have someone else take care of that, and then we can do open source, uh, open access in, in a few years. Do you have uh, some kind of best practice to run a deduplication process where different deep learning methods could be applied? I'm not sure I understand the question, but we do have... Um, um, so that's the key value add, and I'm, I'm sorry I can't share the source code <laughs> because we're, we're trying to build a business. Um, uh, if you want to work with it, you should come to us. Um, we do have, um, like, the pipeline that we're building is about this, and it's iterative. Um, we, we Pipe stuff in that we've learned elsewhere, and and we basically uh, we have um, we work internally in the team. Uh, we write white papers. We uh, have give talks to each other, and it's a wonderful setup. Please come join us. <laughs> uh, does this uh, apply well to computer science papers? Oh yes, uh, archive. Uh, uh, we've we've indexed uh, uh, archive uh, once, but we haven't set it up for re-indexing, and I think we should. It's the whole eat your own dog food thing. Um, so uh, we should get that up and running again um, when we get around to it. Right? We have these other jobs that pay money that we have to do first. <laughs> yeah. Did you try your technology uh, uh, work for languages other than English? Um, no, we haven't found anyone willing to pay for it yet. Um, most of what we do um, can be uh, um, transferred to, to, to other languages. Um, um, not myself fluent in German, but I think possibly there are some rules that would have to be rewritten uh, for their uh, grammar. But I, I th there's nothing um, basically preventing it from being ported to other languages. Um, we've, um, we've been asked to do uh, Chinese for IP analysis, uh, patent analysis. Um, but um, the, the tools that everyone else is using is basically uh, some kind of auto-translation and then applying uh, text analytics afterwards, uh, which is probably inferior, but makes more sense on a cost perspective, unfortunately. Okay. I think that's it. A lot of questions. Thanks for that. And let's yeah. uh, say thank you to, to Mass. Thank you.